Coming up on the Q30 newscast, Quinnipiac officials explore the option of holding active shooter drills on campus. Will they happen? Plus, country music artists return to Quinnipiac for the second annual Fall Fest. And is college really worth the money? Q30's John Small takes a look. All this and more on the Q30 newscast. Live from the Ed McMahon Center, this is the Q30 News Nightcast. Good evening, Quinnipiac, and welcome to the Q30 newscast presented by Joya Spa and Salon. I'm Taylor Popolars. And I'm Liv Dufo. One student was injured after a school shooting at a Kentucky high school this week. To prepare for such an incident, college campuses around the country are engaging in active shooter drills. Our John Alba finds out whether these drills would be practical at Quinnipiac. In safety is any school's priority. That's why Quinnipiac University immediately responded to reports of a gunman following a home invasion in Hamden on September 24th. University is required by law to make the university community aware uh, of a situation that's happening nearby so that they can save, so members of the community can safeguard themselves. Text messages and emails were sent out to warn students and staff of the suspect despite the invasion occurring more than four miles from campus. If they really needed to text all of us about this and email us that maybe it was an actual like risk or anybody was actually in danger or something. The incident proved to be of little concern for those on campus, but what if it occurred less than four miles away? What if Quinnipiac was in a face-off with an active shooter? The school announced last year would institute armed officers on its campuses, with officials telling Q30 would also look into having active shooter drills. But the university now says it does not plan to hold them, and Hamden Police Chief Thomas Wydra understands. So to try to engage in active shooter training uh, in an environment like that, where uh, you have people literally everywhere, would probably be unsafe. Wydra says an active shooter drill would require officials to put more than 6,500 students on lockdown for hours, essentially just for practice. Uh, be, it would be alarming and really difficult to coordinate. But the area is no stranger to active shooter scares. Nearby Yale University had its own gunman threat last year, and sophomore Dane Underwood remembers being notified. I woke up that morning to a phone call from Yale security saying, like, stay indoors, you know, there, there's a possible armed shooter. So I look out my window and I see, you know, military people with, with assault rifles and stuff. Uh, so it's nerve-wracking. Though Yale may have been prepared, not all schools are. A recent survey by Campus Safety Magazine says one out of four colleges is unprepared for an active shooter. And not being ready could cost someone their life. We know that in active shooter scenarios, time matters. And the time that matters the most are seconds. Seconds can save lives. The FBI says anyone confronted by a shooter has three options, to run, to hide, or to fight. But a 2012 study showed the average active shooter incident lasts just 12 minutes. That's why Wydra believes the armed officers on the Quinnipiac campus are a proper alternative to a drill. A large percentage of these active shooter situations are diffused with an active shooter response. Whether that's a police officer or a public safety officer employed by Quinnipiac University, uh, it, do it doesn't matter. It, it, what matters is that person is confronted with an armed response. From Hamden, John Alba, Q30 News. Quinnipiac Student Programming Board held Fall Fest for the second year on Saturday, September 27th. The free outdoor country concert took place in South Lot on campus and featured artists Jana Kramer, the Henningsons, and Tyler Barham. Nearly 2,000 students reportedly attended the event. Students told Q30 <laughs> they enjoyed the concert but wouldn't mind a non-country music event. I mean, I like country for this time of day, like if people are just hanging out during the daytime, country's chill, it's, it's a good environment. But EDM would be awesome uh, for like a later concert, maybe up at York Hill. Or well, you know, it's a free concert, you know, good environment, good music. I got some family down here, my brother and my cousin, freshman and sophomore. I just figured say hey to them, you know. It's just a good environment overall. Everyone's having fun, a good time, you know, in the sun. It's a beautiful day. Members of Quinnipiac's community gathered earlier this evening to celebrate the formal opening of the new School of Law Center. The new facility opened this semester after being constructed on Quinnipiac's North Haven campus. The former law school building was on the school's Mount Carmel campus. The new building spans more than 150,000 square feet and is complete with a two-tiered courtroom, plus a two-story library. Officials say the new location for the law school allows for law students to work side-by-side -side with other graduate students. 
It's probably a question many of you have asked at one time or another. Is the high price tag for a college education really worth the investment? Recent data is showing this may not be the case. Q30's John Small brings us the story. They say college commencement is both a beginning and an end. However, for many recent graduates, there is something more imposing than their tassel hanging overhead. Nationally, student debt now exceeds $1.1 trillion. New research released by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York shows that a quarter of college graduates with jobs are earning barely more than those who only have a high school diploma. Thousands graduate from a wide range of schools in the state, including expensive schools like Yale, Quinnipiac, and Fairfield University. Quinnipiac School of Communications boasts a nearly 89% total placement rate, with roughly 70% of the class of 2013 currently being employed. We're able to say, well, look at the placement statistics. Look at where our students are interning. Look at where students are getting jobs. We can say these things confidently and have the data to back it up. I mean, the, the numbers don't lie. Individual schools within UConn and Yale also have high placement percentages. Southern Connecticut State's Career Services website even has a section titled Jobs in a Tough Economy. You know, you make a, an enormous, an enormous investment into this college education. We want you to make really informed decisions. We find yourself not at the end of four years saying, I should have done this. ROI, or return on investment, is the number that many people point to when discussing whether a degree from a school pays off or not. Payscale.com's 2013 rankings show that out of qualifying schools, only three universities in Connecticut are outside the top 50% for 30-year net return on investment. Though all of this data shows that a degree from a local school may be financially worth the cost, the current state of the economy may be throwing graduates a curveball. According to the Wall Street Journal, accompanying research by the New York Fed also shows that Americans with college degrees are still finding jobs that require only a high school level education. Reports of diverging returns on investment for a four-year degree come as the economy has been churning out more jobs for those without college degrees than for college graduates. There are some who believe that a degree is required for certain fields. In our field of communications, it's virtually impossible to get a job without an academic degree. It's not necessarily because that degree bestows magical powers um, on the student, um, it's the coin of the realm. Though some professionals feel that they could do their jobs without the need of a college education. Coming out of high school, like I could have done what I'm doing now, like as far as what I knew, but I think the years of uh, being older and being more, I guess, more mature and more able to handle things, I think that was what really was more valuable. Colleges need to look hard at what they do and figure out how to pre uh, preserve that value argument, to say that you go to college, you're going to learn skills, you're going to grow, and you're going to be a better person. You're going to learn how to think. Perhaps it's the college experience itself that makes the investment worth it. For Q30 News, I'm John Small. This past Sunday, more than 700 walkers came together for the second annual Beverly Levy Walk to Cure. Levy organized the walk last year, and the event was renamed in her honor this year after she passed away. The walk supports the Yale Medical Center's Department of Women's Reproductive Cancers. Money raised from the event goes toward research for ways to treat cancer in women. The walk took participants through a guided tour of Yale's campus. Food trucks and raffle ticket tables were also part of the event. And Quinnipiac's Residence Hall Council and Department of Residential Life co-sponsored the first ever hall brawl competition this past Sunday, September 28th. The event replaced what many students knew as <coughs> Hall Wars, a philanthropy event formerly hosted by Quinnipiac fraternity Sigma Phi Epsilon for 10 years. This year's event was different than years past because it was open to students from all grades and residence halls, not just <coughs> freshmen. Students competed in events ranging from Capture the Flag to a Minute to Win It Challenge. The Irma Dana Salen team ended up winning the event. 18 teams reportedly signed up for Hall Brawl this year, but attendance was low at the actual event. Still to come in the Q30 newscast, a virus spreading across the country is now in Connecticut. And we'll look at my exclusive interview with Quinnipiac professor Ferday Batty as he explains what ISIS is. Stay with Q30. We'll be right back. And the weather's been pretty gloomy here on campus for the past couple of days, but will it lighten up for the three-day weekend? Your full Q30 weather forecast is coming up. 
Welcome to Joya Spa and Salon in Hamden. Whether you want a new look or the perfect wedding day hair, come to us for complete hair and nail care, cuts, styles, updos, extensions, and beautiful dimensional hair color, as well as manis and pedis, acrylics, gels, and shellac. Treat yourself to a facial, a peel, or microdermabrasion. Relax with a variety of massage techniques, including Swedish and hot stone massage. Joya Spa and Salon. Call today. The Bobcat Shop, located at 1010 Sherman Avenue in Hamden. Your number one choice for Bobcat merchandise. The Bobcat Shop features two floors of countless styles and colors. With a full 19,000 square foot screen printing and embroidery operation on the premises, Campus Customs and Simplify can design and decorate any garment or promotional product as quickly as needed. Stop in and say hi. The Q30 Newscast is presented by Joya Spawn Salon. For more information, visit www.joyadayspa.com. Succeeding in college is difficult, but what if there was a seldom used resource that could help you make Dean's List? Luckily for Quinnipiac students, there is. Our own Sean Clasby has the story. The semester here at Quinnipiac is in full swing, and that means <laughs> pencils, students, and textbooks are in abundance here at the Learning Commons. Yet, I still feel there are students, and a good number of students, who don't understand what the Learning Commons provides. According to Grindle, peer tutoring is the most underutilized resource the university has to offer. In fact, only about one in every five students meets with a peer tutor. Those students who meet regularly feel their sessions are helpful. Yeah, I learn things that are outside of class, like people emphasize on things more. The tutors really spend time on questions that you have so you get more time with things that you don't know. The hard work the students and tutors are putting in can be seen when looking at the QU Dean's List. Every semester we have 150, sometimes 200 students who use tutoring out of the thousand or so students uh, who uh, use tutoring in any given semester who are also on the Dean's List. So we know that, uh, that successful students come here. The students themselves are not the only ones enjoying their success. When somebody comes back to me and says they got an A on an exam, um, it makes me feel so good that I really could help them out when they were struggling. The Learning Commons is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., as well as Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoons. On this upcoming Friday, October 3rd, Quinnipiac University and all of its university offices, including the Learning Commons, will be closed for Yom Kippur. I'm Sean Clasby, Q30 News. Hamden police are on the lookout for suspects involved in 40 burglaries this month alone. Purses, car keys, and wallets are just some of the items that have been stolen. Police are currently searching for a suspect who reportedly crawled through a homeowner's window on West Helen Street while the owner was sleeping. Days before, a woman sleeping in her apartment was tied up and had her debit card and car stolen. And another woman was recently robbed at gunpoint on Mix Avenue. Hamden police are still searching for suspects involved with the robberies, and officials say they are worried the crimes may continue. And the Connecticut Department of Public Health says there are now 13 laboratory-confirmed cases of enterovirus D68 in Connecticut. The virus has sent nearly 500 U.S. children to the hospital with respiratory problems this year alone, spanning across 41 states. The 13 patients in Connecticut have all recovered from the virus and are no longer in the hospital. Health officials say there is no treatment for the illness because it is a virus, but most cases already dealt with have only lasted a few days each. To avoid contracting the virus, wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds and avoid touching your eyes, nose, nose or mouth with unwashed hands. And now to my exclusive interview with Quinnipiac political science professor Ferde Batty. The nation has been watching for weeks as the U.S. continues the fight against ISIS. I sat down with Professor Batty to break down what ISIS is and how the militant group has become so powerful so quickly. Well, Professor Batty, thank you very much for sitting down with me. Thank um, you very much for having me. The goal of this interview is to just help inform the Quinnipiac student body about, you know, one of the biggest na international headlines around our world right now. Um, so, with your expertise, I'd just like to know, 
what is ISIS or who is ISIS? So ISIS is this, is this Sunni, uh, majority Sunni fundamentalist group that um, uh, there are some debates over when exactly um, ISIS became a force in the Middle East. Some say it goes as far back as even in uh, late 1990s. So what would you say, I mean, is it more so that the media is putting a spotlight on them now or have, has there been a recent surge in their popularity and in their strength? Both. Um, so over the summer, they were able to rapidly um, take over territory in Iraq. And this coincided with um, uh, less than a year after American withdrawal from Iraq, and so this raised a lot of uh, concerns. And for students who may not be informed, you know, some students may not even be aware of what ISIS stands for, but what is, right now, currently, what is their sole mission? The, the mission of ISIS, which stands for Islamic State, and that's really the short form. The longer form is Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS, or Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. The Levant is a larger territorial area that um, they believe constitutes uh, territories in Jordan, in Lebanon, and even Palestine. So the immediate goal right now, they keep saying, is that they want to establish what they believe is a caliphate. A caliphate is uh, uh, a middle century kind of uh, Islamic kingdom under the sole authority of one ruler. Do you see their mission in any way justifiable? It's not in any way justifiable given their methods. Nothing um, uh, uh, should lead anyone to murder innocent individuals, especially on the basis of uh, religious differences, which is what they're doing. So a lot of discussion within international media has been about where ISIS is getting their funding from. They have a decent sum of money that's keeping them going right now. Um, do you know where they are getting their funding from or a bulk of it? So first of all, when they um, uh, rapidly moved into Iraq over the summer, when they conquered territory, they took over banks when people pulled out of, for example, Mosul in, 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 um, in Iraq. They took over banks and other buildings. And also, they've been able to tax people who are, they have, they have about 8 million um, civilians living under their authority right now in the territories they've conquered. So they have taxed individuals, asked for individuals to pay taxes to them. And most of all, they've been engaged in dealing in oil in the territories they've conquered. How is the U.S. currently involved in the fight against ISIS? The U.S. is the, at the head of a major coalition that President Obama put together uh, uh, starting last week. Uh, uh, he was able to make a case to convince uh, NATO and other allies that um, ISIS is a threat to world order, given uh, the things that they've been doing. Why should Quinnipiac students want to be or should be informed about ISIS, about what's going on in our world? How does it benefit them? Because no one is lo no longer an island. We live in a global community. Everything that you do, that we do, sitting here, for example, everything that we do is interrelated with what's going on elsewhere. If you go out as a Kunipia graduate, you're expected to know. You can't scratch your head and be oblivious to uh, recent trends that everyone is talking about. And what would you say makes ISIS different from past terrorist organizations, from past militants? Because a lot of the talk within the media has been about major political figures in Washington saying, you know, they're different than Al Qaeda. This is a lot, you know, more terrifying. There's more threat posed with it. So, what makes them different? Someone best described them as Al Qaeda on steroids. <laughs> uh, the level of uh, of violence they've been unleashing on people it really uh, reaches new levels. And lastly, is there anything you would like to add? The, the Middle East is so complicated, and it's such a convoluted place, and, and, and in terms of the conflict and so forth that I really uh, would encourage anyone who, and everyone should take additional interest in this. And if you do, then one of the things I'll encourage you to do is if you can lay your hands on this book, uh, Bernard uh, Lewis's book, The Middle East. This is one, it's a really fast read. It's very fun, very interesting to read. And also there is this uh, special edition of The Economist that, was, um, that came out on, on, on you know, the, 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 the history of the Middle East, which I really encourage um, everyone to read. Well, Professor Batty, thank you very much for sharing your expertise, and I hope to talk to you again soon about the Ebola crisis. Thank you very much for having me. And now we move from ISIS to the rest of the world. Here's Q30's Matt Sharp with your world news headlines.
evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here are tonight's top stories from around the world. Hundreds of thousands of pro-democracy protesters filled the streets of Hong Kong for the sixth day at Wednesday in an attempt to prevent Chinese interference in the territory's 2017 elections. The protesters are calling for the Chinese government to step away and allow citizens to elect their own leader. This protest opposes a recent decision by China's communist regime to evaluate all candidates for the election. The first case of Ebola has been confirmed in the United States. The Center for Disease Control released this information on, on Tuesday, explaining that the patient recently traveled from Liberia to visit family in Texas. According to the CDC officials, the patient fell ill while in America and tested positive for Ebola after being, after being in the country for more than one week. The unnamed patient is currently undergoing treatment in an isolation chamber in a Dallas, Texas, a Dallas area hospital. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa has so far claimed the lives of more than 3,000 people since it began. Militants belonging to the self-proclaimed Islamic State have come under heavy assault by Kurdish forces in Iraq in recent days. Backed by US-led coalition air support, the Kurdish fighters have attacked more than 30 towns and villages across the country. This news comes as militant movements in Syria have prompted Turkey to reinforce its borders following recent territorial gains that have brought, it, brought its forces within miles of the Turkish border. And now to Europe, where the European Union says it will continue to keep sanctions in place against Russia, despite noting that encouraging developments have, sin have been made since the September 5th ceasefire. The European Union, as well as the United States, imposed sanctions on Russia's defense, energy, and financial sectors. Additional sanctions were also, pa were also placed on senior officials following ac accusations that Russia has been supplying Ukraine, the Ukrainian separatists, with weapons and soldiers. Moscow officials have denied these claims from the beginning. And California Governor Jerry Brown has signed into law a bill requiring students on state-funded campuses to clear, have clear consent before participating in sexual activities. The legislation is the first of its kind in the United States. It defies consent as, quote, an affirmative, conscious, and voluntary agreement to engage in sexual activity, end quote. The new law means a voluntary agreement, not a lack of resistance, now defines consent in America. For Q30 News, I'm Matthew Sharp. Now back to the desk. When we return to the Q30 newscast, the latest entertainment news from Hollywood and abroad. And a look at the weather with Anna Sackle. Anna? As we welcome the new month of October, we might also be welcoming some more weather. Your full Q30 weather newscast is coming up after the break. Welcome to Joya Spa and Salon in Hamden. Whether you want a new look or the perfect wedding day hair, come to us for complete hair and nail care, cuts, styles, updos, extensions, and beautiful dimensional hair color, as well as manis and pedis, acrylics, gels, and shellac. Treat yourself to a facial, a peel, or microdermabrasion. Relax with a variety of massage techniques, including Swedish and hot stone massage. Joya Spa and Salon. Call today. The Bobcat Shop, located at 1010 Sherman Avenue in Hamden. Your number one choice for Bobcat merchandise. The Bobcat Shop features two floors of countless styles and colors. With a full 19,000 square foot screen printing and embroidery operation on the premises, Campus Customs and Simplify can design and decorate any garment or promotional product as quickly as needed. Stop in and say hi. Good evening, Quinnipiac. I'm Anna Sackle here with your full Q30 weather forecast. So across the nation, it's cooling down pretty much as fall is coming in, as you can see, but it is still pretty hot here in the south. Around Dallas, it's still 91 degrees, but in New York, it's still coming down. It's about 64 degrees, and up north more around here, it's about 57 degrees. And if we move into our local news and you look at Connecticut, you can see that it's pretty much the same all around the state. It's about 60 degrees in New Haven, and it still about 60 degrees up here in Hartford and it gets pretty cold about 59 degrees here in New London and if you look at our radar we've been having rain recently if you guys haven't noticed um, there's been a pretty big storm passing us but hopefully it will be gone by the weekend it should only be raining until tomorrow morning and then after that it should clear up so for tonight's weather it's going to be about 57 degrees with light showers, winds northeast at 9 miles per hour. And for tomorrow, it's going to be about 65 degrees, cloudy with showers in the morning, but not too bad with winds northeast at 13 miles an hour. Now for the seven-day forecast. 
It's going to be about 65 degrees on Thursday, and through the weekend it's going to be about 70 and drop to 62, but it should stay around that. It's going to be pretty rainy um, and cloudy for the rest of the week, but not too bad. Hopefully it'll start clearing up once Monday comes. That's all for your Q30 weather forecast. I'm Anna Sacco. Now back to the desk. Thank you, Anna. The world of entertainment is buzzing after a pretty significant wedding took place this weekend, Taylor. It's big news. It it's is. It's very big news. Everyone's been buzzing about it. And I think we're going to toss it over to our own Maddie Holloway now for the latest. Thank you, Taylor. George Clooney is a married man. The actor and British human rights attorney Amal Alamuddin tied the knot in Venice, Italy on Saturday. The guest list was full of celebrities, including Matt Damon, Cindy Crawford, and Anna Wintour. The couple was seen leaving their hotel Sunday on a taxi boat. Clooney and his new wife had a civil ceremony to legalize their nuptials under Italian law on Monday. And Olympic gold medalist Michael Phelps was arrested for a DUI early Tuesday morning in Maryland. Phelps was also charged with excessive speeding and crossing double lane lines. A Maryland Transportation Authority officer cited the Olympian for hitting 84 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone. The police re released a statement saying Phelps was cooperative. Phelps took to Twitter after the arrest to apologize to his followers. And the first Clinton grandchild has been born. Chelsea Clinton husband Mark Mizvinsky welcomed daughter Charlotte Clinton Mizvinsky Friday night. Clinton announced the news on Twitter over the weekend. Grandparents Bill and Hillary Clinton also took to Twitter to post a picture with their new granddaughter. Chelsea and her husband decided to wait until the child's birth to find out its gender. And Amanda Bynes has been arrested for another DUI. A California Highway Patrol officer says the actress ran a red light at an intersection and made a complete stop in the middle of the same intersection. Bynes is being charged with a misdemeanor and was released on a $15,000 bail. But that isn't the only trouble the actress is in. According to TMZ, Bynes was kicked out of the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising last month for allegedly showing up to class high. She is currently on probation for a 2012 DUI arrest. Her next court date is scheduled for October 23rd. And lastly, Walmart has responded to comedian Tracy Morgan's lawsuit. Morgan and four others were riding in a limo bus when they were struck from behind by a Walmart truck back in June. Walmart says the injuries from the crash were caused by the passengers not wearing seatbelts. One person was killed in the accident. The truck driver involved has pleaded not guilty to the criminal charges. That's all for your entertainment news. I'm Madeline Holloway, and back to the desk. Thank you very much, Maddie. After the break, we take a look at the latest Quinnipiac Athletics news. Stick with Q30. We'll be right back. Welcome to Joya Spa and Salon in Hamden. Whether you want a new look or the perfect wedding day hair, come to us for complete hair and nail care, cuts, styles, updos, extensions, and beautiful dimensional hair color, as well as manis and pedis, acrylics, gels, and shellac. Treat yourself to a facial, a peel, or microdermabrasion. Relax with a variety of massage techniques, including Swedish and hot stone massage. Joya Spa and Salon. Call today. The Bobcat Shop, located at 1010 Sherman Avenue in Hamden. Your number one choice for Bobcat merchandise. The Bobcat Shop features two floors of countless styles and colors. With a full 19,000 square foot screen printing and embroidery operation on the premises, Campus Customs and Simplify can design and decorate any garment or promotional product as quickly as needed. Stop in and say hi. Welcome back to the Q30 newscast. There has been a lot going on in the Quinnipiac athletics world. We have our own Dylan Fearon here with the latest. Thanks, guys. The men's soccer team extended their winning streak to three games yesterday after defeating Niagara in the first MAC game of the season, two to nothing. After scoreless first half, senior Michel Baker opened the scoring in the 56th minute. With only 15 minutes left in the game, sophomore Ryan Schneiderman sealed the win for the Bobcats with a headed goal of a cross from James Doig. The Bobcats take the field again on Saturday to play Canisius in Buffalo. Staying on the pitch, the women's soccer team fell to the Fairfield Stags today 4-1 in Hamden. Sophomore Jessica Fontaine had the lone goal for Quinnipiac, with Cassidy Bogle picking up two goals for the Stags. It is the second straight 4-1 loss for Quinnipiac, and the Bobcats will look to snap their streak with a home battle against Canisius at 1 o'clock. 
the women's rugby team lost to the defending national champion Norwich Cadets on Saturday, 45 to 38. Bobcats were led by two-time All-American Natalie Costco, who had three tries and two assists in the contest. The Bobcats, who are now 2-1 and one on the season, are idle, are idle this weekend, but head to Provo, Utah next weekend with a battle against BYU. Finally, the volleyball team finished the past week with a 1-2 and two record, defeating Fairleigh Dickinson 3-2 last Wednesday and falling to both Fairfield and Hartford 3-0. Bobcats are now 0-3 in MAC play and 2-13 and overall, but their next two MAC games are at home. Marist comes to town on Saturday and Siena on Sunday. Both tilts are set for 1 p.m. For more information about Quinnipiac Sports, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook at Q30 Sports. Guys, back to you. Thank you very much, Dylan. Now, with the seasons changing, experts are already making predictions for the upcoming winter season. Our very own Elijah Westbrook is on the quad. Elijah? That's right, Liv and Taylor. Well, temperatures right now are pretty much within the mid 60s and 70s, but that can soon change once November and December rolls around when temperatures start to decrease. Many local meteorologists are saying that temperatures will be at an all time low and we will be getting a record breaking amount of snow this year. This is what it looked like outside earlier today. Rainy and cloudy, but generally temperatures stayed in the mid to upper 60s. This is what it could look like outside as soon as November. That kind of sucks, to be honest. I hate the snow. It makes me feel a little nervous. I'm living off campus this year, so it could be a pretty rough drive to school. Might have to miss a few classes. Meteorologists predict that the upcoming winter could break previous records in snowfall and even temperatures. According to an AccuWeather winter forecast, a decline in solar activity combined with rare ocean activity will result in below normal temperatures and even above normal snowfall. I really don't like snow. Yeah. Last year was enough, so that's really surprising that's going to be even more. And it just seems like it was just yesterday when Blizzard Nemo trucked through the New England area a couple of years ago. The question really is, could we see an even bigger blizzard coming this winter? I wouldn't mind a few snow days here and there, of course, but um just more concerned about, you know, the overall general public and what that looks like in terms of preparing for the storms and how well we can be prepared for it. And the snow can come as early as November. Make sure you take out those hats and start bundling up. I'm Elijah Westbrook. Let's send it back to the studio. Taylor, Liv. Thank you, Elijah. I'm not looking forward to the winter. No, not at all. But that'll do it for this week's edition of the Q30 Newscast in the season of fall. Mm -hmm. Stay connected with our news team throughout the rest of the week by visiting our Facebook page and following us on Twitter at Q30 News. And be on the lookout for a new Q30 News Department project, the Q30 News Weekly Digest, which airs this Friday afternoon. Thank you for watching and have a good night.